although this course is mainly devoted to teaching you received pronunciation from the point of view of learners of English as a foreign language, nevertheless, it's useful from time to time to have perhaps closer contact with reality. And so this lecture is about the kind of speech you will hear in London, in particular, in particular what we can call popular London speech, which deviates in various ways from what is regarded as standard. I must emphasize that I'm not myself a native Londoner. Nevertheless, I will do my best to imitate the examples that I shall put before you as best I can. If you'd like to listen to something more authentic, there are various tapes available in the listening center. I know some of you who have already, have already made use of the listening center. We've got uh, two more afternoons, I suppose, after today, in which it will be available for you in Wilson House, and you're entitled to go and listen to tapes and so on that are available there. It's useful in talking about English in Britain to make a distinction between a dialect and accent, where dialect refers to all the various different things that go to make up language, not only pronunciation, but also grammar, vocabulary, usage of various kinds. And to distinguish this from accent, which, in this sense, refers just to the way you pronounce the language. Because it's perfectly possible, and indeed becoming increasingly usual, for people to speak standard English with a variety of accents. They would be avoiding dialect in the sense of non-standard grammar, non-standard usage, but nevertheless using a pronunciation that is characteristic of some particular social or geographical background other than that associated with received pronunciation. <coughs> and because of the demographic changes in Britain over the last 50 years in particular, the spread of education, it means that more and more people in universities as everywhere else come from a background that is not associated with received pronunciation and nevertheless are educated people and in the course of education learn to use standard English, which can, as our Ministry of Education puts it, can be expressed in a variety of accents. Okay then, we have to decide when we're talking about Cockney, whether we're talking about a dialect or an accent, and the term is used indifferently for both. As uh, a dialect, looking at the non-pronunciation features, we can say that Cockney is similar to a lot of urban, non-standard English. By Cockney, we do refer, of course, to the working class speech of London. If we set up a social hierarchy of classification, stratification of social classes, we're talking about the lower end of the social scale as opposed to upper class, upper middle class, middle class, lower middle class, higher up, we're talking about the working class towards the bottom of the social scale. Nevertheless, although it has many features shared with working class speech in other parts of the country, Cockney also has some of its own, as we shall see in a minute. One of them is rhyming slang, a very famous feature of Cockney. If we consider just the pronunciation, therefore, concentrate on accent, we would say that Cockney is identifiably southeastern. Well, it's English, first of all, rather than, say, Scottish or some other kind of British, and it's associated with the southeast of England. It's generally true that, in terms of historical development, Cockney, London speech in general, is ahead of received pronunciation in terms of sound changes. So that if we consider the great historical sweep of innovations in pronunciation coming in, generally speaking, London speech has all of the innovations associated with RP, plus some more of its own. And this is different, say, from the north of England, 
where typically there are various things that RP has innovated, which the North hasn't. And the North is therefore more conservative, saying cup, for example, rather than cup to drink out of. That's conservative, that's old fashioned, that's associated, that's what English used to be like for everybody before the innovation of changing from love to love, cup to cup, took place in the South and in the history of RP. Equally, the move from short vowel in bath to long vowel in bath is an innovation. Wasn't taken up in American English, for example, not taken up in the north of England, but yes, taken up in London. <coughs> so it's in Cockney just as much as it's in RP. It's important to remember that these entities we seem to be talking about are not really existing objects. There is no such thing as cockney that you can touch and smell and measure in any exact sense. We're talking about vague areas in a multidimensional space. It's really rather pointless to set up the question, does this and this person speak cockney or not? Or perhaps a more precise question, was this person on this occasion speaking cockney? Because you have to define what you mean. And depending on how you define it, you'll give one answer or another. And the big problem is how to define it. As with any accent, the problem is how to circumscribe it. We can find perhaps a typical example of received pronunciation or a typical example of cockney. But the problem is saying where the boundaries lie between this and some other variety. Because there are no sharp boundaries. In particular, as I say, the spread of education to social groups that 100, 150 years ago would not have been educated means that we now have many educated speak people who speak with some degree of local accent. This is true in London, in the southeast of England, as everywhere else. But the southeast of England is a very important influence on English in general. Because, of course, it's associated with London, and London is a very big city. And big cities, typically, are influential, not just in pronunciation, not just in language, but in everything that happens in the way of new ideas, new fashions, new trends. And so in pronunciation, as in many other things, I think we can say that London typically leads the way, and others follow later, if they follow at all. This is true in styles of music, true in hairstyles, true in ways of dressing. It's certainly true in pronunciation and has been for the last 500 years at least. Recently, uh, a writer called David Rosewarne, whose reference is at the bottom of the page, invented the term estuary English. By, me, by which he meant the kind of English spoken around the Thames estuary. That means not just London itself, but the whole of the southeast of England, the whole area uh, of the southeast. And he was referring to standard English, but spoken with a southeastern accent, essentially standard English, and therefore different from Cockney, which is in many ways non-standard. And Rosebourne was clearly a, a very clever journalist or publicist in that he managed to attract people's attention to the claim that he was making. He gave a name to an entity, Estuary English, in a way that people have ever since recognized. And since his first article 10, 12 years ago, people have taken up this expression, estuary English, people who are not specialists in phonetics or dialectology or anything. It's become part of the common currency uh, of British English. We've heard this term. We know more or less, sometimes not terribly precisely, what it means. And therefore, I have to talk about it. I don't think it's actually a new phenomenon, but it's a new name and uh, a term that journalists and so on want to know about. Est Estuary English, according to Rosemont, is also important because 
he sees it as likely to displace, or as possibly going to displace, receive pronunciation as the model for teaching foreign learners. Now, whether this is the case is a much bigger question, and I'll perhaps return to that in my final uh, lecture in the summing up course. But it's certainly the case that many of the sound changes associated with Cockney and with estuary English are seeping into received pronunciation, gradually becoming part of received pronunciation as it changes with the generations, and therefore to that extent his claim may well be true. Okay, well let's now have a look first of all at Cockney. And it's always fun to start with vocabulary because that's easy to get a grasp on. There are plenty of words which are peculiar to London. But because of the factors I just mentioned, they often don't remain peculiar to London, and they tend to be known all over the country, even though perhaps not used actively all over the country. I'm particularly aware of some of these in as much as I grew up in the north of England, and I only moved to London as an adult, and therefore I noticed usages which people who perhaps have always lived in London would not be aware of. I knew, for example, that when I wanted to put the rubbish out to be collected each week, I put it in a bin, but here in London I know they call it a dustbin, and it would be collected by someone whom I call the bin man, but in London is known as the dustman. Now, of course, it's not actually dust that he collects, so this is a, an arbitrary name, knew this word, there were Cockney songs like My Old Man's a Dustman, He Wears a Dustman's Hat, uh, but it wasn't for me an active word in, in my vocabulary because in the North we call them a binman. When there was a television series about these garbage collectors, as the Americans say, they cleverly called it the dustbin men, <laughs> thereby combining the northern and southern expressions so that everybody could understand it. London houses have a peculiar architecture in many cases. If you look at 21 Gordon Square, at the front door that you're not allowed to use, outside the front door there are some steps down and a little tiny courtyard there with a door that you can go into the basement. That little tiny courtyard has a special name. It's known as the area. Well, for most speakers of English, area has the meaning I'm sure you know, surface and so on. Uh, but that special meaning of area is a London usage, which I hadn't come across before I came here. So you put your dustbin out in the area for the dustman to come and collect it, and to empty it into the dust cart. Dust cart, which where I grew up was called the bin lorry. <coughs> All logical names. The Americans would empty a trash can uh, into a garbage truck. So all these things have their own local names. Uh, the other word on our handout, bloomer, is a shape of bread, a kind of loaf, uh, which again has other names in other parts of the country. Special cockney thing though is rhyming slang. Now, slang of course exists everywhere. Rhyming slang is special in that it depends upon rhymes, words that sound similar, words that end the same, but like this. If we take the word head, we find a word that rhymes with it, which is, for example, bread. We then take a phrase that ends in bread, loaf of bread, and we take the first part of it, loaf. And then instead of head, you say loaf. So instead of use your head, meaning think, you say use your loaf. And that's understood to mean use your head, that is, think carefully. You can buy in Dylan's little popular books that have 
100, 200, 300 examples of this rhyming slang, which you can amuse yourself by uh, going through. The other examples we've got on the, on the handout, I wonder who knows what they are. Titfa, what does titfa mean? It's rather archaic now, in fact. It used to be the word for hat. People don't wear hats anymore much, so uh, we don't use the word anymore. But that comes from the phrase tit for tat. The pay tit for tat is to retaliate. Tat, of course, rhymes with hat. So hat is replaced by tit for tit for tat. What does it mean if we say that someone's on his tod, to be on your tod? This, I think, is known in most parts of Britain now. It means to be on your own, to be alone. And it comes from some Victorian character, now long forgotten, whose name was Todd Sloan. We've forgotten the history. He was a murderer or something. I'm not even sure what. But anyhow, own, therefore, is replaced by Todd when you say on your Todd. And I do know the expression on your Todd. To have a butcher's. To have a look. Good. Who said that? Yes, right. What's, what's the origin of butcher's? A butcher's hook. A butcher's hook. That's right. Okay. A butcher has various implements. A hook, a bill hook, a butcher's hook to cut up things with. Hook, look, therefore, have a look becomes have a butcher's. <coughs> to rabbit to rabbit on about something, to go on chattering. Rabbit, 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 rabbit. There's a Cockney patter song used in this. Uh, well, this is meant to be rabbit and pork as a rhyme for talk. I'm not all that convinced about that example, but um, anyhow. Mutton? Hey, he's mutton, he is. It means he's deaf. He can't hear. He's deaf. From cartoon characters in the 1920s, I think, called Mutt and Jeff. Mutt and Jeff. Jeff rhymes with death. So death becomes mutton. Mutt and, of course, sounds like the sheep meat mutt. I should cocoa. No. This is a sort of combination uh, Yiddish Cockney one, because a Yiddish expression is I should know, meaning I don't know. And that's then turned into Cockney rhyming slang as I should cocoa. Cocoa rhyming with no. And a tea leaf is very straightforward. A tea leaf is a thief. So those are some rhyming slang words. There are hundreds of others. And I say you can amuse yourself by making lists and reading books about them. Let's look at something a bit more technical now, namely at grammar. Many of these are shared with other popular varieties of English so that you can hear the same grammatical things in uneducated speech, in uh, non-standard speech in many parts of the country. First of all, multiple negation. In many languages, when you have a negative sentence, every word that has a negative goes negative as happens in, in Russian, for example, or for that matter, in Welsh. So it happens in Cogni. I never done nothing means I haven't ever done anything, or I did nothing, ever. In standard English, you have only one negative, and the others have to be positive. Uh, ain't, of course, means either haven't or isn't. In this case, haven't, and it's a non-standard verb form. Uh, the Americans get very shocked about ain't, which is also found in North America. We're not so worried about it because we remember that even Queen Victoria, almost within living memory, not quite, uh, made use of ain't as a, an alternative form of haven't, hasn't it? Verb morphology, irregular verbs. In standard English, many irregular verbs have three different forms. It might be right, wrote, written, go, went, gone. In non-standard English, 
which is very frequently reduced to two forms. So you get what is a standard past participle used as a past tense, or vice versa. So we have present tense C, past tense seen. You've seen it, meaning you saw it. They done it, meaning they did it. The boys done good. And coming to that in a minute means the boys did well. There are various other differently irregular verbs. The past tense of the verb to be in London is was all the way through. I was, you was, he was. We was. They was. Where I grew up, it's were all the way through. I were, you were, he were, she were. <coughs> okay, so that's not standard. Uh, he don't rather than he doesn't is another one. He don't like it. He doesn't like it. I, I've also got here this reply to you seen in, I never, meaning I didn't. <laughs> and it's a kind of almost auxiliary verb uh, used to negate a past tense. It's a negation of do in the past tense. Um, very frequent in these conversational interactions. Doesn't mean, in fact, not at any time. It means not on the occasion referred to. You drank my orange. I never. I didn't do it. <laughs> it wasn't me. Reflexive pronouns. Uh, well. Myself. Yourself. Logically you expect his self. And that's what you get in many non-standard varieties. His self. Not the himself. What belongs to me is mine, what belongs to you, therefore might be your, and that's what it is in common. What belongs to him is his. I think that's archaic in Cockney, but you find it in some parts of the country. Likewise, what belongs to her is her. But certainly your, your is a live and living in Cockney. But not in S2 English. Extra English would go to the standard form yours. Demonstratives. This, plural, these, that, plural, standard, those, non standard, them. So, them books means those books. The distinction between adjective and adverb, made in most cases in standard English by having an adverb with le on the end, and in non standard English, often you use the adjective. So there was a notice in the station saying trains are running normal, which in standard English, of course, is normal. We've got a number of adjectives like that in standard English, fast, slow, well, and so on, but uh, mostly we have to add lit, and it's a point that's difficult for uh, those who differ from using that form. The boys done good, the boys have done well, the boys did well. There is prepositional usages. Uh, down and up are used in Cockney to mean down at, up at, and also down to, or up to. So, where's Jim? He's down the pub, means he's down at the pub. Where's Mary? She's up her nan's, meaning she's at her grandmother's house. Up at her nan's, her nan's is her grandmother's. Uh, to go down the pub is to go to the pub, to go up the junction, to go up to a pleasant junction. And one that's not just Cockney, but very widespread, and on the boundaries of becoming standard English, I suppose, to say, I suppose you have to say, though I don't say it, and that's out the window, meaning out of the window, throw it out the window, rather than throw it out of the window. Americans use this as well. In the other direction, Londoners usually don't say to pick something up off the table. They say to pick it off of the table. So, just being different one way or another. Possessive pronouns note particularly me, meaning my. It's not really clear whether this is a weak form of my, pronounced me, or whether it really is a different form. The boundary's not clear, but anyhow, you get me, where's my bag? Uh, he's my father. He 
in West Bank language and Afrikaans. Okay, let's turn now to pronunciation, to phonology. I would remind you, you can listen to tapes of this in the listening centre in Wilson House. Uh, we start with some of the stigmatised features, the very non-standard features, which I therefore say here are Cockney only, but that doesn't mean that they're restricted to London, because many of these things are found in other parts of the country. H-dropping is found almost everywhere in England in non-standard speech, all except the far north. About the only big city in uh, England that doesn't have H-dropping is Newcastle on Tyne. And this means really omitting the sound H. That's all there is to it. So it means rather than hand, you say and. One and, and. And the animal is an ops. In London, ops. To say, how are you? In Cockney, you could say, how are you? How are you? Or you might not even have ow, you might have ah, 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 ah. You might get intrusive ah after it, ah, ah, ah. So really very broad cockney. Ah, 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 ah. Not quite so broad, how are you? Estuary English, how are you? <laughs> London flavoured standard English, how are you? How are you? How are you? Gradually merging into our P, how are you? Or hypercorrect London English, how are you? <laughs> <coughs> Getting as far away from how as possible. And this applies to all the words that have H. Mostly, of course, H is at the beginning. Uh, sometimes in the middle of a word, behind rather than behind, the A rather than the A. Notice that. When I refer to age dropping, I'm not talking about pronouns that have weak forms, because you drop those H's in RP. Tell him rather than tell him. Nor am I talking about words like hour, 60 minutes, which have an H in the spelling that is not pronounced in standard English. Hour, honest, heiress, and a few others that you know about. We're talking about words whose standard pronunciation involves H, where the H is dropped, omitted, the handout on the handout, we've got the example <laughs> hammer pronounces hammer and hit pronounces it. There's a London joke, schoolboy's joke. Why is a journalist like a mugger? A mugger, someone who attacks you on the street. Why is a journalist like a mugger? Because they're both editors. Editors. Editors, e head hitters. They both wow. hit you on the head. <laughs> Editor. And that depends upon age dropping them to work. All right, let's move on to the next point, which is TH fronting. Now, as you know, the TH sounds are difficult for many foreign learners. They're also in some sense, marked universally, linguists claim. They're rather rare among the languages of the world. Children are slow to learn them. They're among the last sounds that English-speaking children acquire. So there's probably a general pressure to move away from them. And certainly in many varieties of English, we tend to move away from them. Uh, where Chaz and Dave sing how they would rather be on the Costa Brava. Uh, <laughs> so there you've got rather rhyming with Costa Brava, pronounced in English as Costa Brava. And they rhyme perfectly. However, in London, where you have the voice stage fricative at the beginning of a word, this, that, the, then, it tends to be replaced by a plosive. And so you get, so rather than this and that, you tend to get dis and dat. Dis and dat, dis and dat, then for then. Or in Cockney, you also get all sorts of other things. You get nothing at all. You get zero, is knack. Talking about is knack, meaning talking about this and that. After an N, 
you may just get prolongation of the end. On this and that, meaning on this and that. On this. On the table, meaning on the table. On the. And after L, you can get an extension of the L all the time. All the. And since L changes to a sort of W sound, as we should say in a minute, you get that length of all the time. <coughs> Anyhow, various things happen to these initial notes. Next point, four and three, weakening. Well, some weakening is slightly different in Cockney. Uh, in particular, final, unstressed, O tends to be replaced by schwa, which doesn't happen in standard accents. So that for standard window, you get winda. Cockney schwa is pretty open anyhow, up like, but it's winda, not window. Do you remember in Nicholas Nickleby, uh, Mr. Squeers at Do the Boys Hall, uh, a very bad school teacher, be believes in modern methods of teaching by doing. So he teaches spelling by making the boys do things. And to teach them to spell window, he makes them clean the windows. And meanwhile, they have to spell W-I-N-D-E-R, window. Now, of course, the joke is there that Mr. Squeers is so illiterate, he doesn't know how to spell window. This implies that he pronounces it window, as in Cockney spells it in an appropriate way for the pronunciation window. And therefore, he's not at all a good school teacher because he doesn't even know what he's supposed to be teaching. Uh, I've given you here a minimal pair in standard English, pillow and pillar. Both pronounce the same in broad cockney, both of them pillar. And one of the consequences of this, of course, is you get hypercorrection. So you get not only going to sleep on a pillow, but also having a building with pillows in front of it, <laughs> <laughs> columns, by hypercorrection. Because O goes to E uh, in Cockney, it gets intrusive R after it. Somewhere I've got a tape of somebody talking about tomato and cucumber production. That is tomato and cucumber. Tomato and, tomato and Lincoln with intrusive R. Uh, much more frequent is the weakening of U and two. Now, in RP, these weaken to Y and T before consonants, but not usually before vowels, and certainly not in final position. In Cockney, they weaken to Y and T anywhere, and so you get see ya, meaning goodbye. See ya, see ya, which in RP is see you. See you, and it goes to you, but no further. It goes to you we were discussing the other day, but it doesn't weaken all the way to yeah. So that's a tip for Cockney, non-standard pronunciation, see ya. I'll tell ya. Sometimes in spelling you see it written Y-A or Y-E-R to reflect that pronunciation feature. Both mean ya as against you. Similarly, uh, I'm not sure that I can do it, but I'll try to. That's the standard version. I'll try to. Non-standard, I'll try to. Try to. Try to. Okay, those are some of the stigmatized things and therefore not found in estuary English. We now have a transition zone where there are things that are stigmatized but not so strongly. And the first of these is the ing ending. Now, in standard English, this, of course, is pronounced with a velar consonant. So we say running, morning, feeding. <laughs> and we emphasize to the Spaniards and others, Japanese too, the importance of distinguishing different nasals, the difference between whim and win and wing, and that my name is John and it is not John. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in the case of these ing endings, you perceive the difference, but it just has social value. Because the non-standard form involves an alveolar. So the non-standard is running. Morning. Good morning. Feeding, or sometimes feeding. You go to a wedding, or perhaps a wedding. 
You might eat some pudding or puddin' rather than standard pudding. Buckingham Palace rather than Buckingham Palace. Birmingham rather than Birmingham and so on. This is found in many different parts of the country. Uh, it's not really clear what the boundaries, I say, of Estuary English are, and so probably with Estuary English you'd find variability. People would vary according to the style they're using. They have a more careful version with a vela and a more casual version with an alveola. Next feature, L vocalization. Very characteristic modern trend in London English. Now, you've been told about clear L and dark L. Remember in our previews, clear L before vowel, let, valley, dark L, elsewhere. That's before a consonant, film, or finally, feel. When it's dark L, the change is in vocalization. Because what happens is that the tongue tip loses its contact with the alveolar ridge, and you're left, therefore, just with the darkness, that's the velarization, and no alveolar articulation. So from all, all, all dark L, you get all, all, all. But that's a funny sound. Koreans can make back unrounded vowels, all, but Vietnamese can make them. And one or two other languages, no, not many languages, for most languages, back vowel, non-open, implies rounded lips seems to be a universal preference. So that's what's happened in London as well. You get rounding usually added. And so a shell becomes a shell. 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 We've got a new diff wrong, really. Shell. A bottle becomes a bottle. Or with a glossy stop, as we shall see in a minute. A bottle. So estuary English, bottle, bottle, bottle. Cockney bottle, bottle, bottle. It might be a bottle of milk. A bottle of milk, milk, milk. Unfortunately, the one that I had to put on the picture is red coloured, so that can't be good. And I haven't, at the moment, got a proper drawing programme on my computer, so I can't change the colour. But by next year, I expect I'll be able to do a bottle of white as well as a bottle of red. And there's a, a light bulb, 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 standard pronunciation, bulb, bulb, bulb. If it is not hot, then it might be cold, 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 cold. And the last picture we've got is of a pencil, 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 which is the London pronunciation of standard pencil. On the handout, we've got the example of milk again. We've also got shelf, which was something on the shelf. Middle, in the middle. Notice that uh, up near the middle has lateral release into a dark L. That's difficult. Middle, ball, ball, ball. The new pronunciation with all, middle, is much easier. And I think if you find middle difficult, rather than doing some bad approximation like middle, <laughs> it's better to follow estuary English and say middle. There are millions of speakers of English who do that. So I don't know if you're a speaker of Cantonese or other variety, other languages that have real problems with lateral release and dark hell, well then use all. Uh, tables, rather than tables. In um, RP, it seems to particularly readily accepted adjacent to a labial. So a word like table is fine. Gibson mentions that already in his 1962 book. All right, that's L vocalization. Interestingly, not mentioned by Dickens, not mentioned by George Bernard Shaw in their literary versions of Cockney, 
either because it wasn't then around or because it wasn't a thing that people had noticed. Probably the first. It's probably something that's really pretty new, but it's by now very well established in Cockney and other kinds of English. Oh, we've had edge dropping. That's the wrong one, isn't it? Sorry. Move on to the next one. Glottally. T glottal. Come on. Right. This is the use of a glottal stop rather than an alveolar stop. You know that a T sound you normally make with the tongue tip on the alveolar ridge. But it's also possible to make a plosive by closing the glottis stop. Uh, 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 uh. And in various positions in the word, this is taking <laughs> over from the alveolar closing. I think probably Mr. Ashby talked to you about this the other day when he was mentioning things about consonants. So if we have the animal that conservative pronunciation is rabbit, the glottal pronunciation <laughs> is rabbit, 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 rabbit. Look at that rabbit over there. Rabbit. rabbit. That's a glottal stop. That's one that you might hear in more or less RP certain positions, certainly at the end of a word before another consonant. The remaining ones here are perhaps more striking and more typical of the southeast of England and one or two other areas. Uh, there's a computer printer, which might be pronounced instead as a printer. Printer. Just try that. Printer. 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 How is this different from the American printer? Printer. The American printer has nothing at all. Because American English optionally delete T after N in this kind of position. You don't get deletion in London. What you get is glottal stop. Print, print, and it sounds different because there's a moment of voicelessness. Print, 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 print. So the T is still there. It's not been omitted, but it's made in a different place, namely glottal rather than alveolar. Same is true of butterfly. Butterfly, butterfly, cockney pronunciation. Corresponding to RP butterfly, butterfly, or kettle, 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 the kettle. There you've got both glottaling and elder localization, of course. Kettle, kettle, kettle. Polly, put the kettle on. Yes. Next point on the handout, yod dropping or yod coalescence. When you've got words that have t, the sequence t plus yod, tune, or d plus yod, duke, um, one of two things can happen in London. Either you lose the yod, so tune, duke, or more usually you coalesce the yod with the t to give an African ch, tune, duke. First of these is the influence of the East Anglia area, the northern influence on London speech. The other is the influence of Surrey and Kent, the southern influence. London, in fact, lies across a dialect boundary from the point of view of rural dialects, and they differ in this respect. And that's perhaps one of the reasons you get both of these in London. Uh, but uh, ever more and more, it seems to be the ch and j that's preserved and preferred. So, what are the days of the week now in London? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday. Just like when you choose something. After N, however, where the standard pronunciation involves N plus yod, new, London speech drops the yod, so you get new. This, of course, is also found in American English, uh, but whether that's uh, the same historical development, nobody really knows. New for new, neutral for neutral, uh, and so on. Moving quickly on, there are a whole lot of rather complicated vowel changes that I call diphthong shifts. 
Here are key words for each of these changes, although uh, they apply to all the words that have that vowel in question. So uh, these are just examples. Standard A shifts to Cockney I. So face becomes London Fice. Ah, Fice, Fice. Today becomes to die. To die, yes. You know, someone is admitted into hospital. Did I come here to die? <laughs> no, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Name, you see. Nine. Uh, standard I, after the I is in price, becomes I. Price. Have a nice time. Nice time, yes. May have rounding I or not I. And in turn, the oi, the RP shifts to oi, so the choice becomes choice. And the boy becomes boy. boy. He's a nice boy. Meaning he's a, he's a nice boy. O, standard O. Well, old fashioned, of course, it used to be O. RP now O. London now O, or something. Opener than that, oh. Go for good. What do I know? Meaning, I don't know. Ow. Why do I don't know? Uh, ow, we've seen already in one of the pictures, haven't we, becoming uh, ow or in Cockney, ow, ow, now. <laughs> e and oo, they're slightly different, well, even in uh, RP in some positions, e, oo. We might have written them. One, two, three. Typically, at the end of a word, you get this diphthongal quality. Uh, in London, this is very much exaggerated, so you get one, two, two, three. One, two, three. Oi, oi. And uh, the radio from the BBC. It's the BBC to you, the BBC. This causes people who complain about education to say that children can't even pronounce the letters of the alphabet correctly. Because instead of A, B, C, they say I, B, C. <coughs> what hope is there for them then? 426, the thought split. Well, this is uh, fairly technical. The long R or of RP splits into two different qualities depending on the environment. When it's followed by a consonant, you get, in broad company, a kind of diphthong O, loan, moaning, bold, or in uh, less extreme varieties of London English, a, a rather close monophthong, lawn, morning, bold. But when it's at the end of a word, or more generally at the end of a morpheme, you get in Cockney, an opening diphthong, a centering diphthong, or, law, score, aren't feeling bored, or in less extreme varieties, are not so close. Monophthong, law, score, bull. But it's a very good diagnostic test for Londoners to ask them about these two words, bull. Do they sound the same or different? the two that are on the handout, because in most varieties of English they sound the same. They're certainly the same for me. Put something on the board, I'm feeling bored. They're the same for Americans, bored, bored. They're the same for <coughs> almost everybody, but in London they're different. In broad company, put it on the board, I'm feeling bored. In not so broad London, uh, put it on the board, I'm feeling bored. The difference between the two. Not to be confused with the next point, the vowel of goat. When this is followed by a historical dark L in London, then it tends to be rather back. So if we take a word like roll, to 
traditional RP row, O plus four, dark L, what you get in London and in many other places is a special dark allophone of before dark L. So you get roll, roll. Then it has a different vowel quality from row does, where you have the ordinary O. So row and roll, for many, many speakers, have a different vowel quality. But it may be just allophonic as long as the L is there. But once the L vocalizes, then it gets absorbed into a diphthong, and you end up with this kind of O diphthong that forgets the London shifted O, and you have minimal pairs like row, roll, which are really two different diphthongs. Uh, what then makes this linguistically very interesting is that the O allophone, historical allophone, is retained in derivatives where the L is still there. So something with which you roll is a roller, and this then is roller in London, whereas uh, a word like polar, as in polar bear, which is not perceived as being related to the North Pole at all, but just an ordinary word, polar, is polar, which doesn't rhyme with roller. And the example we've got on the handout, goalie, in football, the one who keeps goal, goal, keeps a goalie, which then doesn't rhyme with slowly, the adverb can slow. Right, well, the last example here is just one that uh, I put here because it isn't recorded in any printed book as far as I know, and I thought you might have had something at the cut, cutting edge of uh, research. This is post local schwa deletion. Uh, Cockney seems to have a rule allowing you to delete schwa after a glottal stop before a consonant. So providing T has its glottal stop realization, not otherwise, and providing there's a consonant following, you can zero the schwa, get rid of the schwa. So you've got to be joking, because you've got to be jogging, you've got to be, because you've got to be. Quarter past three becomes quarter past three, quarter past three, quarter past three, and other similar examples. Now, I've, uh, yes, I've not got any further display material about references, but I have brought with me a number of books. Some of them that are listed here, others that refer to Cockney, and you can have a look at, if you wish. There are quite a few books you'll find in Dillard's and elsewhere about Cockney. But otherwise, I hope that's given you some kind of a taste of the special language variety of London.